All right. Um, can I have a thumbs up from you guys if you can hear me fine? Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. Um, let's do a quick recap. A second. Yesterday we talked about um the VMware storage concepts. We understood how the storage is mapped to the physical ESXi server. We talked about the partitions, uh, especially VMFS talked about what are data stores. We talked about the virtual machine disk file, right? Um, so I want you guys to raise your hand. Who can tell me what is the name of the disk file? Raise your hand. The virtual machine disk file name. Okay, mashallah, very good. Couple of people raised hand. Okay. Venu has raised hand. Okay, Venu, I want you to tell me. What is a disk file name? Flat.vmdk. Flat.vmdk, Flat excellent. Very good, Venu, I appreciate you. that. Okay, very nice. I am happy now, at least you guys are following me. All right. Another question, okay. What is the file name of snapshot? Once I create a snapshot, what is the disk file name of snapshot that is created? Okay, very good. So the first hand which was raised was by Yunus. So I'll give him the chance, okay? Yunus. Go ahead. Data root PMDK. Which one, sorry? Data root PMDK. Sorry, data, data root PMDK. PMDK. Very good, very good. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate that. Which means you guys are following the session very well. That's nice to see. Okay. Another question. Okay. Little tougher this time. What are the benefits of using a shared storage? So if I am not using a stage shared storage, instead I, I use the local storage, what kind of problems I might face or maybe what benefits I get if I'm using a shared storage? Okay, Yusuf Ali has raised the hand, so let's see. Okay, Yusuf, you can unmute yourself now. Yes, Yusuf. Yusuf, you are muted, I think. Uh, where is he gone now? Anyway, SHAD, who is this? Is it Saad? I don't know. You can raise, you can, you can speak up. Yes, all the uh, advanced features like uh, high availability, fault tolerance, and uh, everything uh, we can do from only from shared storage. Shared storage, okay, very good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you. Your name is uh, Saad, is it? What's your name? S H A D. I can't read it. Yeah, Muhammad it Saad. It is my Shada. name. Yeah, Shada. Okay, Shadab. Very good, Shadab. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, um, as we discuss shared storage, it's important to have a shared storage. Why? Because if you don't use it, first thing is your server becomes a single point of failure. That means if your ESXi server goes down, all the VMs will go down. And on top of that, bringing up those VMs will take time because you will have to troubleshoot and fix the problem, right? If you have a shared storage, uh, you can bring up those machines on the other ESXi host because the other server can also access the disk files and we can use some features which we'll discuss today like high availability features which can make sure the machines are up on the other machine. Very good. Another question, okay. Um, little more tougher this time. What are the requirements, hardware require, requirement to set up a fiber channel SAN? What type of switch I need? What type of adapters I require? Um, who can tell me this? Can you raise your hand? To set up SAN environment. Very good. I see two hands raised here. I don't know what's the name, FF. I don't know what's your name. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, it is uh, Ice Kasi. No, no. For FC SAN, what are the hardware requirements? What what switch do I need? What adapters do I need? I want to know that. Maybe Isharat Unnisa. Okay. Isharat, you can answer if you want. Yeah, we can have, we have like a switch for connector, connecting switch, HPA adapter, and FC port. Very good. Excellent, uh, Isharat. I appreciate that. That was a tough one, though. So we need a SAN switch, right? Then on the ESXi servers, we need HBA adapters. Just like a NIC card, you have HBA adapter, okay? And on the storage box, you need to have an FC, FC port, like that is fiber channel port. Only then you will be able to set up the SAN environment. That's good, that's good. Okay, last question, okay? Um, other than VMFS partition, what is the other partition that I talked about yesterday? There is another part, part, type of partition that VMware supports, the file system. What is that? Okay. First one to raise uh, hand was Arif. Okay, Arif, tell us, what was that? Uh, NFS file system. NFS file system. Very good. Excellent, Arif. That's wonderful. You made me happy. You made my day, guys. Really, I'm feeling very happy to see that. You guys are concentrating. I definitely wish that you will also be an expert in VMware. Okay, so let's proceed. So yesterday we talked about storage. We talked a bit about networking concepts. In that we talked about a standard virtual switch. We also talked about a port group, right? So we can set the security policies on the switch level and also at the port group level. But we create a port group so that we can have dedicated security policies created for that group. For example, if I've got 100 VMs, I don't want to apply same security policies to all the VMs which are part of that host. So I might have different policies that I need to assign to my machines. For example, if you have a finance team, the security policies are different. If there is an IT team, the policies are different, right? For, for finance team, you need to most of the times block the ports. For IT team, you have to keep them open so that they can do the testing and so on. So if I create a um, port group, I can set those uh, setting policies as per my requirements. That's the importance of port groups in virtual switches, virtual standard switches. Then we talked a bit about virtual machine yesterday. We created VMs. We talked about um, snapshots, right? And we, we discussed about quiescing, right? There is a very one important thing we talked about quiescing, right? Um, so quiescing is very, very important. And I explained you the process also, right? Who can tell me what does quiescing do if I enable it? And why do we have to do it? Uh, very good, very good. Quite a lot of people have raised their hands. Uh, Samiullah was the one who raised the hand first. I'm giving him a chance. Yes, Sami, it, uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah. it will pause the system to take the snapshot in a proper way so that uh, uh, later on when we revert back it to it, it will not give any issue or any errors. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good, Sami. Uh, I want someone else also to answer this, maybe a little more elaborative. Zia, I will give you a chance. Yeah, it will stop. It will pause the system for some time and then it will take the snapshot and then whenever you are going to restore it, it will be a perfect restoration for you. Very good. Very good. Very good. Um, Hanif, I want you to tell me, if I don't... Okay, maybe this is... Rehan, Rehan is there, right? Rehan. Rehan, I want you to tell me, if I don't quiesce, what's going to happen to my machine? Rehan? Uh, yes, sir. So generally, uh, we quiesce while uh, our VMs are very busy, like while production are. So I think uh, our uh, VM server will be down. If I don't quiesce. So if we don't quiesce, what will happen? I will not quiesce and take a snapshot. What will happen in that case? 
will i face any problems okay can't answer this uh maybe hold on yunus you can try yeah thanks for giving me the chance so for when we coice it will stop the process of writing the data onto the system so when we start mm -hmm. uh, when we start coice process and take this snapshot it will allow the user to read but it will not add the records to the system so what will happen is when we take this snapshot we will get the right uh, data and when uh, we uh, try when no, if no, we hold, hold on you know you know you know sorry yes. to stop you my question was if we don't quiz what problems will we face that's my we question we may not yeah we may not get the right data if required if if something happens like when we take a snapshot if someone is writing it will not uh, the data will not be captured properly and if require if we require to restore the uh, system mm. at times like when we boot the system it will not mm. boot properly it will say ah very good very good and you answered the question basically in to to make it smaller you might sorry yeah so you might get issues right uh, what might happen is the data might get corrupted to be to be more precise you you might get errors like dirty shutdown from sql right services do not start all such kind of problems you might face so customer doesn't come to you saying that the quiesing was not done and we have um no they will not tell you all the background they will come to you if you are a technician if you are a, a vmware administrator they will come to you like my machine is not booting up now you might start wondering machine doesn't boot up what could be the problem there is some operating system issue you might be wondering all that if you always have to get into the background as to why is he trying to restart what did he do before that now he might open up and tell you that's very important way as a technician especially if you're an sme it's very important for you to um analyze see i was as an sme i worked in sme as an sme at least for close to Five to six years in CA technologies. Most of my team members were uh, with L1 and L2. They used to spend like one month or times two months troubleshooting a problem, and that used to get escalated, escalated, and come to me. And then I used to realize was uh, they they generally miss used to miss out very minor things, and I used to close those issues. Uh, hardly in couple of minutes not by troubleshooting just by making decisions remember every time you don't have to start jumping into conclusions and start troubleshooting for example there was one slow throughput issue i got it was escalated for two months the people were troubleshooting after two months it came to me when i analyzed it i did a research and i said this is the best speed the customer can get there is no need to troubleshoot right it's just like if you have bought a 100 cc bike and this customer is looking at like a, a 350 cc bike and saying my bike is not as fast as that one if you are comparing right like that you will never be able to troubleshoot and fix the problem i said the customer you, this is what you can get that's it there is no need for us to troubleshoot and uh, most of the times the l1 and l2 engineers do these problems many a times i have seen something which is not supported they are troubleshooting for example a free version of esxi host doesn't have a service console on that and they were trying to use a backup product and they were trying to backup the virtual machine and it was failing the backup was failing and they were troubleshooting forever all i did was i checked the version of esxi host it was maybe like 5.0 but i checked the edition of it it was a freeware vmware offers a free edition also a paid edition they did not check it free edition is not supported for backups now the customer was so unhappy saying that after 2 months 
you guys have realized that it's not supported. Why didn't you tell me on day one? Right? That's the problem. Because the guys always try to start troubleshooting. So remember, if you want to be an SME, if you want to be an expert, you have to have a lot of patience. You have to think about the problem, think about the background, think about the history of the problem many a times. Think like a doctor. If, if I go to a doctor and tell him that I've got stomach pain and immediately he starts writing the medicines, then I don't consider him to be a good doctor. I expect him to ask me questions. Where did you go last night? Did you go to a party? Did you eat something, um, some, some junk food, right? Or did, you, did someone hit you in the stomach? Or did you fall down from the bike or something? I would expect him to ask such questions to me. Based on that, I expect my doctor to understand my problem and maybe require... I, I, if it is a much better doctor, if he's a much better doctor, I expect him to give me some uh, diagnostic uh, test to be done, right? Maybe a scan or something. And then based on those analysis, I expect him to give me some medicines. That doctor is a good doctor. And similarly, we also are, if you want to be an expert in IT, right? Your expectation is you have to research, ask questions, understand the history of the problem. Why the system is not booting up? What did you do? Did you take a snapshot? Yes, I did. Did you take with the quiesce or without quiescing? You might say without quiescing. Okay, that's the problem then. There is no need for me to troubleshoot now because you have done a blunder. You have taken a snapshot without quiescing and this is what is expected. All you can do is, if you have a backup, let's restore. Or we'll have to revert to the previous state and boot from that state. But the latest state booting is not, not, not possible. That's it. Very simple, right? So every time a problem that comes to you is something where the something has ha happened in the past and now the problem has come up. And we are now troubleshooting without even understanding why this happened, right? So make sure every time, if you know these things, only then you can correlate. If you know what is quiescing, if you know... If I don't quiesce, what's going to happen? If you know all this, then is when if an issue comes to you, you can start correlating. Okay, this could be a problem, right? Then you can start troubleshooting. So always think, uh, think before start working on a problem. As an SME, if I used to spend one hour on a problem, I would say 50 minutes, almost 50 minutes of the time, I used to spend only on researching as to why this happened. And my solution used to be only for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, I used to take the remote access and solve the problem. But 50 minutes, I used to sit on my desk and start thinking about it, looking at the logs, reading the logs, comparing them, and uh, looking at the KB articles from VMware. So this problem has occurred to any other customer. Looking at the forums. Did someone also face the same problem? What did this guy do for this? All that research used to be more uh, rather than getting into customer's environment and doing trial and error. Let's try to restart and check it out. Let's do this. That, that, that's, that's something which is not expected from an SME, right? So I want you guys to think before troubleshooting. Okay, let's go move on. So today we are going to look at vCenter. It's gonna be very exciting. I want you guys to pay close attention to these important features, right? We'll talk about virtual machine migrations with the DRS cluster, HA cluster, and so on. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about the cloud uh, as to how cloud is actually implemented on virtualization. Okay. So let's go back to our favorite whiteboard. Okay. Right. Let's see. One second. I think I have to stop sharing, start again. Just one second. Here we go. Let's say um, we have a couple of ESXi servers in our environment now. Let's say I've got three servers, okay? And 
I want to manage these, right? One way is I can use this as independent machine and I can start using them. But as I know, uh, if I don't centrally manage these machines, uh, it will be very, very complicated, right? Things becomes very complicated. That becomes single point of failure again, right? So I need, uh, I need these systems to be uh, centrally managed. And we learned about importance of centralized management uh, on the day one of the training, right? So I want to centrally manage these uh, uh, machines, right? All these servers. So I've got, let's say, a couple of VMs here. In the real time, what we do is we set it up, for example, this is host one, host two, and host three. In real time, we are going to use a centralized storage, a shared storage, something like this. Right? Then we can uh, create some LUNs here, right? Let's call it as LAN number one. And we map this to our host. Again, it's going to be a data store. Could be VMFS or NFS. All right. So we have mapped this LAN number one. Now this becomes a data store. So these VMs are now hosted here, right? Like flat.vmdk, these files are created here, right? But in reality, these files are stored here in the form of blocks. Okay, one second, yeah. Okay, so in real time, this is how it is going to be. They use a shade storage, right? And then we create LUNs on them, and then we map the LUN onto the ESXi server. Now, what type of connections we use, as I said yesterday, it could be iSCSI, it could be fiber channel SAN, right? Uh, through maybe the NBD network mode, it's up to the customer to decide what they want. Now, we want to centrally manage these because I don't want to keep opening different consoles and start working separately. It becomes very difficult for me, right? I need to have a centralized management system for this. So what do we do in that case? We will use something called VMware vCenter server. VMware vCenter is more like our Active Directory for centralized user management system. All the users are centrally managed like that. vCenter is also an application, right? That has to be installed. Just like how you install Active Directory, you have to install VMware vCenter. Now vCenter server comes in the form of appliance now. An appliance means it's a, it's a pre-built virtual machine. What they do is they install that uh, yeah, operating system on it, also install the vCenter application on that, and they bundle it and give you a ready-made downloadable uh, appliance. 
it's more like you go buy a laptop which has got pre installed operating system pre installed ms office all you have to do is just power on and assign the the laptop name and just create your login id and password and you're good to go we center appliance is just like that it's pre installed just download it deploy it and use it right so you can deploy to any of the machines any one on any one machine you can deploy it vcenter when you do this after vcenter is deployed you can log into vcenter through the browser i will show you in the lab now from the browser now you can add your esxi servers inside it right one two three and you can centrally manage them okay let me show you how let me show you in the lab how do we do that uh, just give me a second i need to stop this i'll just show you in the lab to make it easier This lab will take some time to launch, I think. Just a second. Okay. All right, my lab is taking a bit to start. So let, let, let's let's dis discuss this further before we proceed to the lab. Um, so now, it's pretty straightforward. Don't really worry about how to install this vCenter and how to configure it. It's very, very straightforward. Just a matter of running a few clicks and then your vCenter is ready. Now, the, the concentration that has to be as to how this is actually, how this works in the backend, right? And what features does it offer is something we'll talk about, right? Uh, because we don't have much time. We're doing a very short workshop, right? That's why. So I'm skipping all those basic topics which you can do it yourself. So like things like how to install, how to configure, these are practical things you can do it yourself, but you can't read and understand the technicalities behind this, right? That's why I'm trying to spend more time on that. So let's say I have added all these machines which are part of my vCenter now. If I do this, I will get more benefits because vCenter offers a lot of new features which are not available on a standalone host. Few of the features are like, it offers you to create something called a clone. Clone means, let's say I have created a VM and I've deployed my operating system, I have deployed my all the required applications. If I want to create a copy of this machine, I can just clone it. It creates exact copy of your virtual machine. Now for a physical machine, it's very difficult. You can clone the hard disk, but it, you, it, it's, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Um, but here in VMware, all you have to do is just right click on the VM and say clone, it creates another copy of your virtual machine. You can also create templates. Now, template is something, for example, you want to print a wedding card, right? So they will first ask you to select a sample and then they will give, ask you to give the content. Once the content is given, the design is selected, they will first prepare a template and they'll show you this is how it's gonna look like, right? And from that template, they will create all the 1000 copies or whatever number of copies that you want. So one master copy will be there, that master copy will be there, which will be used to create more copies from that. You might be thinking, can't I do it from the clone as well? For example, I have this VM. I can create 1000 clone copies of this. Then why do I need a template, right? So clone also gives you, it's just like I'm talking about, uh, I have one copy of my certificate One option is I can take a photocopy, which is like Xerox, right? 
100 copies of Xerox I can take. Why do I need to go to printing shop and ask him to create a master copy and then uh, give out, like print those 100 copies? So if you're printing a wedding card and then you're going to a Xerox center and taking um, 100 photocopies, it's a, results are same. End of the day, you get the same results. You get 100 copies of this. But in reality, in real time, why do we create templates is something that I'll explain you now. What problems we face in real time is, just give me a second. Hold on. Right. Just hold on. Huh? You can't see the screen. Okay, okay. So hold on. It's okay. I was not drawing anything there. Okay. You're able to see the screen now? Okay. Recording is on. Okay, don't worry about that. Okay. Now, uh, what I was saying was there is clone and there is template in VMware. These are very basic topics, though. You might already know, but uh, uh, recording I've already started. Don't worry about that. Recording is on. I don't know. Someone is asking, start recording. Okay, recording is already on. Okay, so people don't know the the reason why we use it in real time. That's what I'm trying to show here. In real time, what happens is, let us say I have one Windows machine, Windows 2019 machine, which is in production, okay? We are using in the production. Your manager comes and says, hey, can you create like 10 more Windows 2019 machines, copies? The answer is yes, I can do it. I can create clone of this, right? Into 10 copies I can create. I'll get 10 2019 machines. This is clone. But what I'm saying is we don't use clone for creating repeated copies like this. Clone is used only in real time is when, for example, I am doing a major upgrade for this. And I'm worried that if something goes wrong, I will have to have another copy. Snapshot can help you, but some organizations are concerned because Snapshot is just creating another Delta file. Uh, we are kind of dependent on that. They, they, they more rely on creating another copy itself entirely and keep this as a separate copy. Right, or they do the upgrade here on the copy itself. And if it is good, the original one they will they will bring it down and they will use the, the copy. Clone is used only for that purpose. We don't keep creating multiple clone copies if you want. For example, there is a testing, uh, there is a software development company. There is a team which is working in for testing the product. So if there are 10 guys in the team. They need 10 copies of this machine, right? We can create 10 co clone copies of this, but we don't do this. In real time, we use templates for these kind of requirements. So if I keep getting requirements to create copies, what I do for this machine, which I have got 2019 machine, I create a template from this. Okay. From this template, I create copies. Why? Because a template is something which cannot be modified. This machine, if I am expecting to create copies every day, let's say there's a security pass installed, this gets modified. Or someone might restart it, someone might power on, someone might make some changes inside the machine. So if there is a change in the machine, when I create a copy, that change is already there in that copy. So we don't want any changes to happen. We, I, 
as soon as the management has decided this machine is is going to be a fixed one we don't want any further changes if i create a copy i just want exact same copy i don't want any changes in that if you use a real machine and create a clone on daily basis there might be changes on that machine but from a template there is no change as soon as i create a template from a machine the day i create a template it is locked no further changes are going to happen on the template so every day when i deploy new machines from that template you will get the exact same machine without any changes is this clear guys i want you to raise your hands and tell me clear very good excellent 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 so template and clone both both of both both of these features give you the same results but the reason why you why we use this in real time is different templates if you want to re create recurring copies we use template because template cannot be modified so that we want the exact same copy we use template clone is something we use it when we are doing an upgrade of the machine we just want to have another copy right before doing that major upgrade we create that clone temporarily and then we discard that template once the upgrade is done very good so yeah, i've already repeated shake uh, template and clone okay um okay now let's move on to look at the v center the lab is up now Here we go. Just one second, I need to log in. Just a second, huh? I've stopped sharing. Okay, very good. I am logged into vCenter now. Okay. One second. This is my vCenter. All you have to do is go to the browser, put the vCenter name, then log in with the credentials. And then after you're done, okay, I'm just going to go to the screen. Hold on. I get to see this host and clusters, right? And I can add multiple. First thing, I have to create a data center. It's like a virtual data center. Why do we create a data center? It's like per location, we create a data center, like Hyderabad, Bangalore, Chennai, whatever cities you have, whatever physical ESXi servers are there in that location, we create a data center and add the machine. For example, there is a DR site that we have. In that, we have added one ESXi host here. There is a production site we have. In that, we have added another ESXi host, right? So all the machines which are part of this host will be listed here like this. All the machines which are part of your host to ESXi host to. So if you see, this is centralized management. From one console, I can see my ESXi host number two, host number one. I can do all that, right? I can manage them. On top of that, I can, as I said, we create, we get these additional features in this, right? Like clone. If I want to create a clone, all I have to do is right click on the VM. I have the clone option. Click on create clone, it'll create. Let me do it for a small machine. Otherwise, it will take some time. Uh, I will do it for this machine. Let me show you. I will right click on this machine. I say clone. vSphere. The machine name is vSphere hyphen tiny. I can name it as clone. If I want to make some changes in this new clone copy, I can do that also. Right? Some storage changes. 
Sorry, it's asking me where to put it. Okay. Some customizations if I want, like I want to increase the RAM on the new copy. But for example, existing machine RAM is like 8 GB. I want the clone copy to have a 12 GB RAM. I can do that. Uh, if there is a question. If you create clone of any VM today and some update happen tomorrow. That update. So the question that was asked is, on the original copy, if there is some update happens, will that get reflected to the clone copy also? No, like it would not because clone is a new copy. Clone is a separate new copy. So it's a new machine, but an identical machine is created, right? For example, you have two MS, one MS Word file. You create a copy of that file. Now you open the original file and you modify. Will the copy also get modified? No, it doesn't, right? Copy is a copy. It's just like that. Clone is also a copy. So I'm creating this clone here. So while creating the clone, as I said, it gives you the options to customize. I just showed you, right? While creating clone, it gives you the option how to modify. Now, later on, if you want to modify the clone after you have created, you can do that also. They say, this is my clone copy. You want to make changes to this clone in terms of configuration, you can always do that. You can right click, say, go to edit settings. This is your configuration. You want to increase the CPU, increase the memory, increase the disk size, add more adapters, add any further hardware devices, you can do that. No problem with that. This is my clone. If I want to create a template, again, all I have to do is just right click and say clone to template, right? That will create a template of that. See, it's creating the, where is that? Yeah, templates are not visible here. For that, I have to see, click here, okay? Here is where template will come. Here we go. You see the template? So template, if you see the, the picture is different, right? Um, uh, Abdul has asked, which is something which will not be possible now, Abdul, a sizing question you've asked me. So the difference between clone and template is, template, you cannot power it on. There is no power on option for template. It cannot be modified. All you can do is you can keep creating more copies from this template. Clone is something which can be powered on, which can be modified and, and so on and so forth. So we create template is like a master copy. I don't want any further modifications on this. From here, we create, keep creating more copies. So the expectation from the organization is, I want to have exact copies of these machines. In that case, you create a template. Templates cannot be modified. The only way if you want to modify this template will be to convert this back into a VM, power on, make the changes, and convert it back into the template. But otherwise, directly a template cannot be modified. All right? So that's basically what is the difference between clone and a template. These are very basic, but I have told you what happens in real time. The reason why we use a clone and template in reality is something that I told you. So I want to keep that in mind. Yeah, so Muhammad said, yeah, template does not consume your memory or CPU resources. Um, it does take the storage, of course, because it is consuming that information. But memory and uh, CPU does not 
it doesn't con consume because it's not running. So it's in a powered off state. Obviously, it doesn't consume any uh, resources from the machine. Okay, let's move on. There are a lot of other benefits that we get. Let's talk about uh, migrations. Okay. Now let's take this scenario and I have these machines, these, uh, sorry, I'll use a different one. Let's say we have our data centers, okay? One data center is in Hyderabad. One second. Okay. Hold on. First, I'll explain in the local. Okay. Then we'll go to that remote. This is our data center. Okay. Within that, let's say I have got two ESXi servers. I have built a shared storage. I've also built my V center. And I've created the VMs also on that. Right. So this is V center. This is ESXi one, ESX two. Okay. This is virtual machine. This is virtual machine. This is my shared storage. Right. Okay. Just hold on. Okay. Now, because these machines are centrally stored, we have our data stores also here. Let's do that. Now these machines are centrally stored, which means the data is here. Now, let us say I want to restart this host. Now rebooting this host means all these VMs which are in the production will go down. But you have to restart because you may have applied a security patch, then obviously I have to restart. So one option is I have to take a downtime from all these application owners, maybe database SQL guy, some file server, domain controller. I have to ask all these administ administrators to give the approval. Once they agree, I will bring these machines down and then reboot my machine. But that is not realistic. That is not something we can do in real time because um bringing down all the machines is not something that we expect right so think about it like there are there could be like two or three hundred odd machines running on the host all the 300 machines you cannot bring them down it's going to be a major impact right in that case what do we do in vmware is we use a feature called vmotion in vmotion what we can do is we can migrate this virtual machine from host number one to host number two. All these machines can be migrated.
it can be live migration which means we don't have to shut down these machines these machines can be running the users will not get to know uh, that there is something happening in the back end machines will be smoothly moved to the other host now you can do all your activity of restarting the machine once the machine is restarted you can bring all these machines back to your host. That is what V motion is. So far, is this clear, guys? Yes, no. So far, is it clear what is V motion? Now I will have some questions for you. Okay. I want you guys to answer this. You have to think, okay? Don't raise your hand before, okay, before the question is asked. Okay, now you have to think wisely and give me the answer, okay? I don't want anyone to be answering without thinking. The size of this virtual machine, the hard disk, let us say 100 GB is the used space. And the RAM of this machine is 8 GB used okay we have assigned 16 gb but currently 8 gb is in use okay now uh, if i am doing a live migration of this vm okay from host 1 to host 2 i am moving it i will show you how to do it in the lab but if i am doing it my question is how much data will be migrated? So 100 GB is the used space of hard disk, 8 GB is the RAM of the used space, okay? I am moving this VM from host 1 to host 2. How much data will be moved from here to here because the machine is moved to the other host now? I want you guys to answer this. Think carefully and raise your hand. Don't answer in the chat. I want you to raise your hand, okay? Okay, so first one to raise the hand was uh, Abdul Aleem, okay? So I'll give him a chance. Okay, tell me, Abdul. Abdul Alim, you uh, you are unmuted. You can talk. We can't hear you. You can talk now. Are you talking, Abdul Alim? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. But is your headset muted by any chance? Headset button might be muted or maybe the volume is low. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Okay, Ashrafi, I'll give you the chance, okay? Ashrafi, where is he gone? Anyway. Hello, hi, sir. Okay, please. Tell me no, how much it, data will be. It, it will not move the data because it is a shared storage. Okay. So what will it move? It will move the machine one host to another host or it's memory, I think. You are Adnan, is it? Yes. Yes. Ah, I could hear I could hear your voice and understand. Okay. <laughs> okay very good. Uh, <laughs> Thank Adnan. you. Sir. So you are my student, you already know the answer. That's why I want someone else also to answer. Okay. Uh, uh maybe. Okay, new guy, Muhammad Shiraz, okay, you answer this. I, I think actually he answered the, the same answer was mine also, because it's a state story, only the active memory, what is there, it will be uh, transferred. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I hope all the others also might be they were thinking in the same lines, okay. So it never moves this data. We don't have to migrate the data because the other machine can access this data. 
my host too can access this data. We don't have to move this. All we move is the memory, right? The memory which is on this physical host. So this physical host has the RAM. So what is this RAM? The RAM is nothing but the running content. So when I log into the machine, let's say you log into a laptop. There are two things. Remember yesterday, day one, I gave you example of the showroom and the go down. So if you want to, if you go to a showroom, whatever is there in the go down, which is not on the display is your hard disk. Whatever is there on the display is your RAM. So when I open my laptop, whatever applications are currently running are in my RAM. Applications which are closed are in my hard disk. For example, I don't open Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge anymore. I use Google Chrome. So Microsoft Edge is sitting in the hard disk. Google Chrome is in the RAM because I've opened it, right? If I don't open a notepad, it's there in the hard disk. So whatever is open or currently running, maybe as a service, that is something which is there in the RAM. Because we are doing a live migration, when we migrate this VM from this to this, we expect all, all the applications which are currently open, they all they look exactly the same on the other host. We don't want machine to be restarted or something, right? We don't want any interruption. That's why we copy this memory content from host one to host two. But one question is, this memory content is this always running content. You cannot just copy. By the time I copy this, right? By the time I copy, for example, we copy in the form of blocks, right? So maybe a 5 MB block or a 2 MB block. So maybe I'm transferring block by block. My speed could be like, maybe I'm doing a, 100 Mbps per second or something, maybe one gig per second, right? But I am not able to, I won't be able to transfer all the eight gigabits in one go. The problem is when I'm migrating this RAM, by the time I migrate or copy this, there'll be more changes coming in because it's running memory. It always keeps changing. And that's the problem. Now, by the time I finish my eight GB, there'll be some more data already there. It's more like, I'll give you an example. There is a tap, okay? There is a water tank here. There is water in it, okay? And I have a bucket here. Then this is, think like a ram. This is your ram. This is water in here. Problem is the water keeps flowing. I have another bucket. I am moving this water from this bucket to this. And I'm taking this and moving it to another tank, tank two. Think like this is your host number two. But the problem is, by the time I move this water, there is some more water always. I cannot move this entire bucket. I have to take another bucket and keep moving it. You guys tell me what is the best way that I can move everything from here to here because this water is always flowing, right? And I have a small bucket. I, I don't have this much bigger bucket. So it is a 10 liter bucket. I have a one liter bucket, which I'm moving it. By the time I finish nine liters, there'll be always one liter at least here. So what can I do here to make sure is entire water is moved here? Is there a way? Can someone think of it guys? Can raise your hand. <laughs> Someone says connect the pipe. So there is no pipe. There is no other facility we have. Okay, All we have is these two buckets. One liter bucket we have. Using that bucket only I can move. We, I just cannot do anything else. This, this like I don't have a pipe. I don't. I cannot get a bigger bucket. It just... I have to do some small changes. Abdul Aleem has given an answer. Very good. Hanif has asked this good question. Is there a quiet option? Very good question. Yes. So what happens in the V motion is 
in the end of the migration period, when almost 90% of your data is migrated, the last bit when we are migrating, we do the quiescing here. Which means there is a freeze. We'll pause it, pause the water to flow, then we'll move everything. On the bucket, everything is moved, then this is, we're going to delete all this content from here because the machine is moved somewhere else. Why am I telling you this? The reason why I'm telling you this is, in real time, if you get a request to do a live migration, you have to tell the respective application team that there can be a business impact. Because I'm doing a vMotion, right? There can be a freeze on the machine and you might see some challenges. If I don't tell this, don't take it lightly. I was, I upgraded Oman Airport, okay? The, the data center in Oman Airport. Um, uh, not Oman Airport, I'm sorry. It's Orido, Orido in Oman, okay? Orido is the ISP in Oman, like just like you have Act Fiber in India, right? They are like that. So what they told me was even a one second pause to the machine will bring them a huge loss to the company. Why? Because that is ISP. One second freeze means for them, many calls will get disconnected. Many people will get disconnected from the internet access, which means they are using food delivery apps, they are using Zomato or whatever, cab booking, all that. There will be a huge number of transaction failures in that one second. And they clearly told me, Mahmood, you have no chance to even freeze the machine for one second. And I said, there is no other way. We This is how it works. We have to freeze it for a second. Other option would be to bring these machines down and move, which is going to be a major challenge. So you know what they did? In the entire Oman, they have sent out messages and emails to all their customers that during this period, as you get an alert from your Airtel and Vodafone, right? Our services will be down from this time to this time. Sorry for the inconvenience, right? They rolled out such message in the entire Oman and they said, Mahmood, now you can do it. Then our team immediately start, started. They gave us a window, one hour window. You just have to do everything in that one hour, right? So we picked the, the hour when least amount of customers would be using the internet access. Maybe that was like midnight, 3 a.m. or something. So our team like got up 3 a.m. and they started just migrating all these machines. Remember, if you had not known this and you had migrated, and your customer would have screwed like anything to you. He would have filed a complete legal case against you saying, our entire Orido network was frozen for a second. We got a huge amount of loss. Just imagine what would have happened, right? That's why if you're at an architect level or an SME, you have to know these facts. Why am I telling you all this? If you know this at the beginning, beginner's level, the organization would definitely hire you. They might think he knows something which architects know, which big people, the SMEs know. This guy knows that there's a quiet that happens when, during the V-motion that many people don't know, right? So keep that in mind. If you're using these terms in the interview, I'm pretty sure they will hire you, right? Okay. I think I should give you a break now because it's almost... Uh, hmm? Okay, well, uh, let's wait, let's wait. We're not now. We have prayer time after five minutes from now. So I will give you a break after that. Okay. So, so far, is the V-motion clear, guys? Can I ask you to raise your hands, please? Clear. Very good. Very good. Okay. Someone is raising a black hand. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, okay. Fine. Good. So that's V motion. Okay. Um, we also have other types of migrations, right? For example, 
um, vMotion requires a shared storage, right? We know this. Just think of like, if you don't have a shared storage, then can I still do a migration? So can someone answer this, guys, if you guys know? If I don't have a shared storage, can I do the vMotion? Can I do the migration? Yes or no? You can raise your hand otherwise. Oh, I get no, no, no everywhere. Few people raise their hands. Okay, Mirza, I want you to answer. Mirza Mazhar, I've allowed you. You can unmute yourself. Mirza, are you there? Uh, hi. Uh, it's not yeah, just... to use data. It will be very difficult to make it. <laughs> okay. We know it's difficult, but can we do it or not? Migration, is it possible or not? Possible. Possible. Okay, very good. Very good. Others, let me take opinions of others also. Uh, Suleiman. Okay. I'm giving a chance to new guys who have not raised their hands before. Suleiman, you can answer this. Thank you, sir, for allowing me to answer. So, yeah. yes, it's possible to migrate the uh, machine from one host to another host using a cold... Uh, Cold migration, we say the virtualization terminology. Okay, cold migration. Okay. So it's but like can I, can't just... I do live migration? Live migration, I think it's not possible because the uh, because we don't have the shared uh, storage between the hosts, so it will not allow us to do the migration in the live state. Okay, hold on. Let me give chance to others. Okay, thank you, Suleiman. Ishrat, you cannot try. Yeah, live migration is possible in the cold uh, migration. We can yeah. do it live. Live migration is possible even if I don't have a shared storage. Is that yeah. correct? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Next question is, the answer is yes. You can do live migration even if you don't have a shared storage. The question is how? Who can answer this? How can we do that? In that case, how much data transfer is going to happen? Yeah, considering 100 GB use space of disk and 8 GB RAM. This time, Hanif, okay, let's see this. Let's give a chance to him. Hanif, you can answer this if you want. Hanif? I've allowed you. Hanif is not answering. Arif? Yeah, uh, I think in that case, we need to migrate the you know storage as well as the VMs to other, another EXSI in the storage to the storage to the Very storage good. box, which have access, I mean, a second EXSI have access to. Very good, very good. Excellent answer, Arif. Appreciate that. Uh, Hanif, you're saying something? Thank you. Can you... Yeah, uh, I think there must be an option because uh, all businesses are not big. So there are some small businesses. Mm -hmm. So we can do the uh, migration with business impact. We can ask the customer uh, to have some time, downtime, so that we can do the migration. No, 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 Hanif. The answer is we can do live migration without stage storage also, okay? That is possible. I'll tell you how, okay? It is possible. Okay. Let me show you, okay? Let me show you. Here we go. Let's think of this scenario that I have my branches, okay? One is Hyderabad. Another could be Bangalore, okay? In this case, I cannot have a shared storage across different cities. It's going to be very, very difficult to do that. 
I could have local short stage storage. Maybe if I have another host here, this is possible, okay? This is quite possible. So we have our own shared storages here. But what if, if we want to move these VMs, right? Um, from one city to another city, right? They are backed by a router, right? Maybe something like this. And then goes to a switch. Like this, they are connected, okay? Now, if I want to move this machine from Hyderabad to Bangalore, right? Here is where the problem comes. I cannot have a shared storage across different cities, right? So in this case, we use something called shared nothing vMotion. This is also live migration, but the difference is in this case, the migration will be RAM and your disk flat.vmdk, right? These both will be migrated. So the VM will be here and the flat.vmdk. It takes longer than uh, just local vMotion. Shade nothing will take more time, okay? So it's going to be totally 108 GB bar. Yes, uh, Paul, that's the right answer. So it's going to transfer 108 GB, 100 GB your disk, 8 GB your RAM content. So this is possible. Shade nothing vMotion, migrating the virtual machine memory and the disk together. Here also quiescing happens at the end, right? That is, that has to happen. Um, the others are like cold migration is also there. Cold migration is, uh, if you don't want this quiescing to happen, or there is something where you can shut down the machine and you can do the migration, that's what we call it as cold migration. Uh, this is majorly done because when you're doing vMotion, the ESXi, um, Hardware, there is a problem with that actually. The hardware compatibility. For example, if I'm using, uh, yeah, cold migration means the machine is in powered off state. In that case, no quiescing is going to happen. No memory contents are transferred. Only the, if they have a shared storage, then in that case, what's gonna happen is, uh, ideally nothing is copied. It's just gonna do some registrations and then the machine is up. For example, host one, host two, right? Uh, shared store storage. The VM is here. And they are part of a shared storage, right? If this is off, right? we can do a cold migration. Now, there is no memory here because machine is off and it doesn't have to transfer the data because it already has access. So what is it gonna transfer? All it's gonna do is registration. That's it just registration, this machine is gonna be removed, right? And it's gonna be added here, that's it. But why do we do this cold migration? Mostly we do it because vMotion has a limitation. The limitation is the CPU, right? On these servers must be same. The model of the CPU must be same for vMotion for live migration. If there is a different brand, for example, you're using 
um, Intel here, right? Or for just uh, AMD here, just giving an example. If this is the case, then you cannot do vMotion. It is not supported. The hardware, the CPU has to support. Both must be from the same family of the CPUs. So if it is Intel, though, oh, they should fall in the Intel category. There is a list from VMware that tells you supported categories. If the, if the hosts are falling in that supported categories, we can do live migration. If this is, now real-time scenario will tell you why this can happen. Obviously, no organization will have different CPUs, right? Why will they do is Mostly when it is a new organization, like you are doing a migration. This is your old company. I have acquired this company. For example, now Broadcom has, has acquired VMware. So they are migrating all their data centers from one location to another location. Broadcom might be uh, AMD fan, VMware could be uh, Intel fan. So they might be using Intel so far. Now they're moving it to new machines. Now those machines have different CPUs. That's the real time scenario where we have to do cold migration because it is not supported. And you have to know this because if you're getting into a project like this and customer says, can you do migrations of these machines, live migration, don't blindly say, yes, we can do it. You have to check all these compatibilities before doing my live migration. So if there is a dissimilar CPU, then obviously I cannot do. So cold migration comes into picture most of the times in migrations, maybe from old machine to a new machine, which has a different CPU. So we said cold migration. We talked about shade nothing migration. We talked about vMotion. We also have something called storage vMotion. Storage vMotion is you are moving your data, not the virtual machines, data from one storage to another storage. The example can be, let's say I have got this host here. I've got this host. I have a data store. So I have a state storage box, which has got multiple LUNs on this. LUN number one, LUN number two. Both are mapped as data stores, D1, D2, sorry, D2, D1, okay. Let us say this virtual machine is on D2. And this is full now. This is, let's say I've created a 100 TB LUN size. This is also 100 TB. This is full. Now, if I'm storing data on this, it will say insufficient disk space because now the data store to which your LUN is mapped, this is completely full. What am I going to do in this case? Obviously, I have to move this machine flat.vmdk from D2 to D1, which means it will move from here to here because this has got free space. So this is also live migration. In the back end, you can move the storage from one LUN to another LUN, or maybe you've got another storage box which is mapped. You want to move all these to the new storage box because you are restarting a storage box. There is some maintenance happening on that, right? If you restart storage box, even that will end up restarting all the VMs. So you get a new storage box, you map it to the hypervisors, move all these uh, files from the, like one LUN to another LUN, then do your maintenance. So that's what storage vMotion is. Clear guys so far, any doubts? Okay, then. Clear? I want you guys to raise your hands. Okay, very good, excellent. Okay, let's break for, what's the time now? What's the time in India? Oh my goodness, always have to, 10, 10. We'll meet at 10.30, uh, okay, India time.
10 30 india time will make will meet
Hi guys, hope you're back from the break. Kindly raise your hands if you're back. Or message me on the chat. Very good. All right. Let's go on then. Nice to see. Okay. Now let's talk about migrations. Okay. Now, uh, sorry. Uh, we'll talk about um, DRS cluster now. Okay. Second, let me see. Let me quickly show you how to do vMotion before that, okay? I'm in the lab, okay? If I want to migrate a virtual machine from one host to another host, okay? All I have to do is, uh, first of all, we need to configure, right? Obviously, there is a lot of configuration that's, that it takes. We'll not get into that. We have to create a kernel port and we have to do all that. But migration, I'll just do a cold migration and show you because it doesn't require uh, uh, any configuration. So I, I, all I do is right click on the machine. I say migrate. And uh, if I want to do vMotion, select the option change compute resources. Okay. Um, if you want to do storage vMotion, use the second option. If you want to do shared nothing vMotion, use this option. Okay. We'll do this one. We'll move poop uh, because this is local storage we're using in this lab. So I'm moving from production to DR site. Okay. And uh, nothing else we're moving. So this machine vSphere tiny cone uh, is on production data store. Now it will see it is immediately migrated now. It is now listed on the DR site. You see this? This was very fast because it's a small virtual machine, but in real time it takes time, right? If you're doing shade nothing, depending on the data transfer speed and all that, it takes time, but um, it doesn't really matter in terms of uh, production impact because it all happens in the back end, so users don't get to know. So they will continue to do their work, okay? Now let's get into our um, whiteboard. So we talked about all these migrations and so on, right? In real time, in what scenarios do we do the migrations? One of the scenarios is if you want to restart your your ESXi server for maintenance, you do the vMotion. But there are other reasons also. The other reasons could be, for example, um, let's take a new page now. Let us say, this is my data center. Host one, host two. Shared storage is there. And VMs are here. Now, one of the other reasons is, let's say the utilization of this host is gone up. Maybe it's now at 90% utilization, okay? RAM and CPU. So I'm running short of resources on this machine. Maybe I have more VMs running here. This virtual machine utilization is not high. Maybe it is just at 30%. In this scenario, also, we can do migration. Maybe I can move this machine from host one to host two. So when I migrate it, obviously the utilization will come down. Maybe it'll come down to 70%. This will shoot up. Maybe it'll go to 50%. I'm okay with that because I'm balancing it, right? But this is okay if it is one-time activity, 
or there are just hardly a couple of machines that you've got, you want to do this V motion manually. Think of an organization which has got huge number of ESXi servers and there are a lot of VMs running and they keep having these challenges. Few of the hosts going, shooting up and few are on the low and you cannot manually do this. You can't keep monitoring and then you log into vCenter, right click and say migrate and do that. Can we automate this feature? The answer is yes, we can automate it. Think of um, an automation where it's something which automatically monitors and if the utilization of the host goes high, it automatically migrates a VM uh, from one host to the other host, which has got uh, low uh, resource utilization. That can be done through something called DRS cluster, distributed resource scheduler. In VMware, we call it as DRS cluster. So if I configure this cluster, what's gonna happen is, let's say I've configured this DRS. Now both are part of a cluster, okay, DRS cluster. Now my vCenter is going to do this. vCenter is going to monitor the utilization of my all the hosts which are part of my DRS cluster. And it will use vMotion in the backend. As soon as the utilization goes high, it will move the machines automatically to the other, other host. And again, if this one goes high, the other one comes down, it just moves the, moves the VM back to the other host. So in the host, you might have more, obviously you can have up to like 128 uh, ESXi servers per DRS cluster. So let's say we have got some 100 servers. So host number one goes up, host number 50 goes low, it can move from there. Again, like host number 10 is high and host number 90 is low from 10 to 90, and it just keeps moving across. And vMotion keeps happening across, right? So that your all the ESXi servers are balanced. This way, your business impact is gonna be minimal because host utilization does not get affected. Clear, guys, about DRS cluster? Configuring cluster is pretty straightforward. Let me show you how to do that in the lab. If you want to create a cluster, right? All we do is you can just say new DRS cluster. Okay, we have this. Just hold on now. I have to look for this. A lot of changes in new version. My goodness, hold on. So we get this option, new cluster, okay? I can give a name like DRS, okay? Uh, I can enable DRS like this. All I have to do is just enable this. And I say, okay. Cluster is created, but I have to add these hosts into the cluster, right? So I can just drag and drop like this. I have to put the host in maintenance mode before doing that. So it will put it automatically and then move this. So now the host is in the DRS cluster. Now per data center, you can add like we host in the cluster, which are part of the same data center. I cannot add a host from the other data center into my cluster because I only have one host in this uh, data center, I can add only one. But if I had multiple, I could do the same thing. And then I can obviously on this DRS cluster, we have uh, some settings that we can configure. There are more things to that DRS cluster, things like uh, DRS automation levels, fully automated and partial automated and all that. We'll not get into all that details because we don't have time. So this is just like automation where you're, utilize, you're utilizing your resources 
uh, better, right? It's optimal utilization of resources. Clear, guys? Are you clear with why we do vMotion and why do we use DRS cluster? Is it clear? I want you to uh, raise your hands. Okay. All right, very good, thank you. So if you have understood, one of the students has this question, he wants me to explain again, but I want you guys to explain it, someone who's already understood. I want someone to explain this, why do we do vMotion? And why do we use DRS cluster? Who can answer this? Raise your hand. Because you said you have understood, right? So I want you to raise your hand and I want you to explain. Anything that you know, why do we do vMotion? I want you to tell me the scenario. Or why do we create DRS cluster? Who can explain? Yusuf Ali has raised the hand. Vikar has raised the hand. Sayed Sami. Okay, Yusuf, you can explain. So thank you for giving this opportunity. VMotion is a migration from one EXA to another EXA to sir. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, Vikar, can you explain further? Uh, so, if uh, a VM is go is has a high utilization, and uh, there okay, are a few okay. other VMs uh -huh. where there is low utilization. So um, if there are thousands of VMs, we can't manually monitor them. Right, right, right. So we use DRS to make it automated. And then um, that DRS cluster will keep checking. And then it can move the high utilization machine to the low uh, ESX and that way they can balance yes, it. Very good, very good. Excellent, Vikar. Good answer. Appreciate that. Maybe, Yunus, I want you also to answer this. You can explain your own fashion. Yeah, thank you, sir. For DRS, uh, like if large organizations, like uh, if a server utilization goes high, it will move the host. Uh, it will not move, VM. The, it will move the VM, not the host. Yes, sir, the yeah. VM. Sorry, it will mm -hmm. move the VM to the host which has a lower in utilization. So when we configure right. DRS, uh, what it will do is it will do things automatically. Like it will, we do not need to monitor manually. DRS yeah. system uh, will monitor it. And we, whichever host uh, has a lower utilization, it will move the VM to that host. And it will just balance mm -hmm. all the uh, host with the proper uh, moving of the VMs. Very good. Excellent. 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 Yes. I'm very, very happy to see this. Most of you are giving right answers, and I really appreciate that. It's, of course, it's for your own good, right? So I will anyway teach and go away, but it's you who's going to get benefited from the training. Very good. I hope this is clear now. We will move on to the, the next topic, which is... Uh, HA cluster, okay? Think of a scenario where your host has suddenly gone down, okay? Now we'll not talk about DRS. We will talk about another scenario. Let's say we are not worried about utilization that DRS is taking care. Now we will talk about HA cluster. Let us say, suddenly, my host has gone down. They are on the shared storage, okay? No doubt about it. But if suddenly it goes down, VMs will go down. We know this. Even though we have shared storage, they are running on this. VMs will go down if the host has gone down. Now what we can do is manually, because we have access to this, we can register these flat.vmdk. So we get something called .vmx file, which is the configuration file. All I have to do is register this vmx file here. 
as soon as I register, this VM will be automatically listed here. That's all. That's it. I All I have to do is I just need to register them. And then I can power on these machines. So all registrations can be done. Right? Dot VMX. And it's very simple to register also. Just right click on the dot VMX file and say register. It will automatically register. And these VMs can be powered on. So within a couple of minutes, you will see the VMs are now up, right? There is, of course, a downtime here because our host has gone down abruptly. We just cannot do anything about it. That happens, right? There are other mechanisms like fault tolerance or a VMware SRM class, uh, site recovery manager. They can help us to have this uh, high availability or fault tolerance if VM suddenly goes down or host goes down, the VM on the other host will be automatically available. Veeam also, the other products like third-party products like Veeam. Veeam has um, CDP, continuous data protection, a SQL as SQL always on, and there are a lot of other features available in the market using which you can make sure there is no downtime. But here in, in VMware, what I'm talking about a scenario is Let's assume we are not using any of such technologies or applications which can give us fault tolerance. We are just using a standard vCenter and we have got this host and host has gone down. And these VMs also will go down, but instead of me troubleshooting to fix this, bring the host back and then power on the VM, I can register these VMs immediately on the other host I can power on. But again, doing this manually will be difficult. Why? Because if there are too many VMs and if it just frequently happens, it will be tedious for you guys to do that. We can automate this feature also. And to automate that, we need to enable something called HA cluster in VMware, high availability cluster. It's a misleading term in VMware. I don't know why they say high availability. Generally, for me, high availability means there is no downtime. But in VMware, they consider it to be high availability, but still there is a downtime in this. Okay. So if I enable HA cluster, as soon as these machines go down, my vCenter with the help of HA cluster will immediately register these VMs on the other host and it will power on. So with the minimal downtime, your VMs will be automatically powered on on the other host. That's the benefit of using HA cluster. But requirements are you must have shared storage. If there is no shared storage, you cannot. Yeah. If there is no shared storage, you cannot uh, you know, use HA cluster. Is this clear so far? The basic understanding of what is HA cluster? Okay. Okay, clear so far? All right. There is there is a lot to understand within this HA cluster. Uh because uh one person to look at it's disturbing. Uh, uh, there is a lot to understand within HA, uh the, how there are basically how this HA monitors, because if the host has gone down. How will my HA cluster come to know that these VMs are down? How will it initiate a power on for, for the VMs on the other host? What if, if my vCenter itself is gone down? Will my HA cluster still function? The answer is yes. HA will still function because as soon as we install configure HA cluster, the it will pick some VMs and consider one of the VMs to be the master. And other VMs, no, one of the hosts to be for example, I've got two hosts here. HA cluster will deploy HA agent, okay, on the host actually. It's a kernel module. It will make one of the hosts, let's say this one as a master. The job of this host is to monitor the other view, other host, right? If it detects that the host is down, then it will immediately initiate a restart of the VMs on the other host. So there is a mechanism behind it, but we cannot discuss that because that's 
uh, HA topic is a huge topic. Obviously, you can't do that in very short span of time. But I'm just trying to give you a high-level overview that even if your vCenter is down, HA will continue to function. And the benefit of HA cluster is if there is if your host is gone down with minimal downtime, it can make sure your VMs are up on the other host. All right. That's about the HA cluster. And finally, now we will talk about how the VMware is a, or virtualization is a foundation for the cloud. Now, a lot of people get confused here as to they think that VMware is different, Azure is different. So, uh, they think that Hyper-V is different, AWS is different, right? You're seeing all these things as different. But I'm telling you honestly, uh, there is not much difference in this. Thing. This is just the business strategy I'm telling you. They are making, giving us ease of access. Let me give you an example. All the while, if we wanted to shop for the items, right, we would go to the shop. Let us say you want to buy some dress materials, right? You have a shop for this. You have a supermarket, right? Then you, you could have a grocery store. These are your stores available, right? And all the while, if you wanted to buy something, you would go to that store, right? And buy your items. The problem was all the stores are physically located somewhere and you had to walk or travel to all these different uh, stores and buy your items. And you would get those items, right? This is how it has been. Now there is a change. We have got the di digital platform and now you can buy the, the items online, right? You have got so many apps available, right? Now you can log into your, for example, Amazon. And you're going to offer, let's say you're going to buy some dress. You guys tell me, this dress that you're buying online from Amazon, is this dress different from what you're buying from here? Is it different or same? It is different or same? Same, right? In the back end, Amazon is doing nothing. I'm telling you the same vendor, the store guy, he will register his shop in Amazon. The grocery store will register same shop in Amazon. I am ordering from here or I go here, I get the same item. The only difference is you go to Amazon only for the ease of access. You just want everything in one single location. You can just add items to the cart and you buy. You don't want to go to different shops and buy the items. But I'm telling you, end of the day, in the back end, there are still stops running. Think of it, this is like virtualization. And this is cloud. Now you tell me, some people think that virtualization will go away. So which means we'll close these shops. If you close these shops, will Amazon function? You tell me now. Will Amazon survive? No, right? There's no chance. This is exactly how it is. Your VMware is your backbone. Cloud is just the platform. Amazon, AWS, right? They are offering you virtual machines. Where is this VM created? In the back end in the Amazon, they have a data center. On the data center, they will again have the hypervisor. 
the story is that they don't tell us what hypervisor they are using. They could be using VMware, they could be using KVM, they could be using Hyper-V. It doesn't matter for us. End of the day, they are still using a hypervisor. Still, these VMs are here. It's Amazon, AWS, Azure. Some people ask me, shall I do AWS, shall I do Azure? It is like you are booking a cab, you book Uber or you book from Ola. What difference does it make? Ola guys and Uber guys are registered from the same cab. Sometimes same guy comes for Uber, the same guy comes for Ola also. Only the look and feel in the app is different. It's the same thing, AWS Azure, the way they offer services. Uh, Uber says, uh, we will give you 50% offer, 50% discount. If you book the cab, you get uh, the next ride free, right? Ola, you log in, you get the look and feel is different. The offerings are different. At the end of the day, the service is the same. All you have to learn is all the settings and the interface. So I log into Amazon website to buy something. All I have to know is like, how do I filter out the items and buy an item? How do I select the items, add to cart, buy them? Right? So you lo log into Azure, it's just going to be slightly different interface. So if you're working as an AWS or Azure admin, what's more important for me to tell you is you need to know how it works in the back end. It's, it's hypervisor. What is this virtual machine? How does it function? If I'm taking a snapshot, what is happening? Why there is a quiescing happening? What are these virtual switches? Why there is a security policy on that? That's more important. The interface of AWS might look different than Azure, but there is no difference in the way they function in the backend. They will still have a virtual sieve. They will still have a standard storage, shared storage. They will still have those snapshots, those clones and templates, right? Everything is the same thing. Hypervisor offerings are different companies are offering hypervisor, but end of the day, there is a VM still. What difference does it make? Right? So if you know how to drive a car, right? Do you tell me that, no, I can only drive Indica. And if I give you like Maruti, Ertiga, or if I give you XL6 or any other car, are you going to tell me that, no, I, I don't know. I don't know how to drive all the other car. I can drive only one. You cannot say that. If you know how to, how to drive, it means that you can drive any car under the sun. All you have to know is maybe the gears could be different. So few cars could be like, there is no like, we have this uh, clutchless cars, right? There is no clutch on the car. Some cars have some, I think Skoda has a reverse gear in the front, like lever, you have to pull it in the front for Skoda. That's the only difference. The lever you have to, instead of pulling in the back, you have to pull it in the front. Do you think that really makes difficult for you to drive that car? No, right? This might take a day or two for you to understand those, get adjusted. If you know the underlying technology, the point I'm driving here is, if you know the underlying technology, anything under the sun can be managed. Don't ask me which is complicated, AWS, Azure. I see everything as the same. I don't see a difference because I know the backend. I know what happens in the background, what's connected to what. These kind of 100 interfaces will come in the market. Don't get afraid. There's, there's nothing. There's no rocket science in this. They have made it more easier for us. VMware has a private cloud. vCloud director, they say. So people think, oh, I'm, I'm looking for a vCloud director to send him to Singapore. And honestly, I've been, we've been looking for like almost four to five days now. We couldn't find a vCloud director trainer because I'm a bit busy. I just can't travel there. I have other travel plans. And all the other VMware trainers I found, they say that we can do it, but not vCloud director. I said, what's so difficult about vCloud director? They say, oh, it's a cloud concepts. We don't know. It's, it's so interesting to see that you're actually not understanding that underlying technology. If you don't understand that underlying technology, it's going to be a nightmare for you. The challenges that I have seen in the real time is in my, my career I have seen, in my experience I have seen, is the 
willingness to learn is minimal. Now I'm going to talk something which can boost your interest in studies. I have seen many people in my career. When I joined CA Technologies, I was new to that VMware concepts. But when I was, when I used to work on a problem, I always used to take time understanding why this happened. And when I used to ask this, my seniors, my SMEs, that can you tell me why this problem is happening and why are we making this change? How does this change affect? And they always just used to tell me that don't worry about that. Just, just make this change and just close the case. And many of my colleagues used to do the same thing. They used to only concentrate on getting those numbers. Oh, I've closed like five cases today. I've closed eight cases today. And my closures used to be like just one case a day or two cases per day I used to close. And they always used to think that Mahmood is way behind because he's just achieving the target, which is which is not even uh, uh, appreciated by the company. So I used to spend like an hour or two just to solve one minor problem initially. But later, you know what happened? A couple of years down the line, I started understanding the technology. When I knew the technology, Eventually, what happened is the people who were above me, who were report, whom I was reporting to, they started reporting to me then. My manager said, now he is the SME, you guys have to report to him. And that's happened. And the people who spent four, five years, there was five years senior to me, they were reporting to me. And I've seen that in my career. The reason is they were only worried about coming to office, closing the cases, going back to home, or spending some time on Facebook, right? Spending some time watching some videos and go back home. And I was more concerned about understanding why this is happening, why are we applying this solution? Just a couple of years, and then you can see the results now. Even today, all my seniors who are there, they are still hunting. Some people lost the job, still hunting for jobs. And many people say, we don't find a job. I'm telling you, there are jobs in the market. The reason why you don't get hired is because of lack of knowledge. There is nothing in the market that people say we don't hire. People say, I'm not getting a job because there are no job openings. No, it's a big lie. I'm telling you, there is nothing as such. There are jobs in the market. You're not getting hired because you, you're not skilled enough to be hired. If you are skilled enough, they will hire you. Certifications, qualifications, nowadays companies are, I'm telling you, not even concerned about this. They say, we want someone who's got knowledge. I have seen many times, our my manager rejected certified guys and hired someone who's not certified but had good knowledge. And my manager always used to tell me, when you're interviewing Mahmood, first you look at the knowledge. If this guy is knowledgeable, don't worry about his certification, just pass this guy in the interview. And that's what I used to do. And that's the right thing. If I look at certification and then I hire him, if he's not knowledgeable, this guy will never be able to work. And some people think that uh, I just can't learn. I don't have guidance. I don't have someone to mentor. I uh, all these kind of excuses people give. I don't have enough money to go get certified. I don't get time to do. So I asked one of my students, can you take one hour every day just to study well uh, so that you can grow in the career? He said, it is so difficult, sir. I just cannot take out one hour every day. My job is like so hectic. I just can't do it. I asked him another question. I said, okay, tell me this. If tomorrow your manager tells you, we are going to give you a 50% hike, but we want you to work two hours extra every day, are you not going to work? He said, I will. Or not even 50% hike. So many other people, the company suddenly will tell him, look, you, also, you have to work one hour extra every day or two hours extra every day. Otherwise, we'll fire you. How are you getting those two extra hours every day now if your organization tells you that they will fire you or pay you more? I've seen many people even working on the weekends just because they get paid more. 
they'll get some extra payment on weekends. They all go to the office on weekends also. Which means it is not a skill issue, but it's a will issue. You're not willing to study. You're not willing to learn. Don't give me complaints that I don't get time. Your willingness is the problem. And why is that? Why are you not willing to learn? You're not willing to learn because you don't know what you're going to get after your learning. Because there's always a question that comes inside your heart that, that will ask you, what's in for me? Why am I doing this? Why are you getting ready to work two hours extra if your manager orders? Just because you know I'm getting extra, I'm paid, getting paid extra now. Immediately or inside your soul will tell you, yeah, let's do it. We get 50% more now. Let's do it. You are excited. But the same thing I tell you, you have to study for two hours extra. You will grow in your career. You say, who has seen that? Yeah, I don't know if I'm really going to grow. It's so boring and so on, all such questions. Because first of all, you have to explain yourself. You have to convince yourself that if I study an hour extra every day, over the period of time, I will definitely grow. And why? how do you convince yourself? The best examples are in front of you. I myself is an example for you. Because now I am leading, I have the, right, one of the top trainers. I have been awarded the best trainer in the entire Asia. How do you think I got this award? Is it just because I am born like that? The answer is no. There was a time where I couldn't speak proper English. People used to laugh, laugh at me. And I used to feel shy talking in English in front of others. And honestly, I learned it myself. I've never gone to a spoken English training center. I've never gone to any teacher who could teach me how to speak English. I used to feel shy. And most of the times I used to, to talk in native language. Though I've been, I've studied from English medium school, but you know how it works in Hyderabad, right? We don't talk in English. All I did is I put my effort. I understood that I have to do it, otherwise there is no go, right? And I've become the trainer. I have grown so much. It's only because I've put some efforts and I have never ever asked for help from anyone. I never relied on someone will come and help me. I actually went to them to, to seek that. So it's you who have to do, remember, it's you not we. I cannot come and teach you at your home, right? Neither can I do anything from my end. It's you who have to decide. Do you really want to become something in your career? Do you really want to grow in your career, right? You have to explain yourself that you cannot live your entire life like a life like a slave, paying loans to the bank, and spending all your life just paying EMIs and there is no money in your bank account and always struggling for paying your loans, always struggling to pay uh, your debts, right? You shouldn't be living a life like that. You should be a, a person who should be always ready to help others. Your, your relative calls you, he says, I, I just need some money, can you help me? You shouldn't be in a situation like, oh, I myself cannot pay my EMI, what can I do for you? If everyone is going to be like that, who is going to help the poor people who are handicapped, who need our help, who are old age? There are widows available and the people who cannot work, right? There are old people who cannot work. There are a lot of people who need our help. And if you are only living your own life, saying, I will survive with my family, I just want little survival, if that's your mindset, then you cannot make this world a peaceful world, right? You cannot help your own relatives who, who need your help. And, and what should I say? Now, if, you, if you're not serious now, I'm telling you, you can never be serious in your life. And, and that's, not, that's not it. There is a lot of danger. If you're not an expert, and that's the problem that you might face in the future is if your salary goes high, the company will fire you because they say that we are paying so much and this guy is not an expert. So we can hire someone who can actually work for a lesser cost. We don't need this guy. If you start hunting for a job with a higher package, no one will hire you. They say, why should I hire you on an architect package? 
when you don't have that much of knowledge, I've seen such people also. If you are like, if your salary goes over 15 or 20 lakhs per annum, you try to find a job with that, that package. It becomes very difficult. Why? Because they expect a lot of knowledge from you. Don't be in that comfort zone. Don't you ever be in that comfort zone. You have to keep learning. If you don't learn, then there'll be a time where, where the young generation will take you over. They'll be much faster than you. Then what happens, company will say that this guy is like old now. He doesn't know the new technologies. So there is no need of this guy. And this can happen. And that is why we as in CGC, trying to encourage you guys, trying to do whatever possibly we can. We are bringing industry experts to deliver trainings. We're not bringing someone who is just a two-year or three-year experienced and who just reading from the book and teaching you, right? You, We are bringing the market leaders to deliver trainings. Last training, Nazim, who's, uh, Arshad, who's done, he's also uh, one of the security certified, leading security certified engineers. Very few are certified in the market like him, right? And many people attended that training also. The reason why we are doing it is just we want to make sure our all the young generation, right? Irrespective of the caste or religion, whatever you are. For us, we look at humanity, right? Every human is our brother. And we want every human to grow, not a specific sect, right? So we're just trying to help everyone who's, who's just in the need of help. And honestly, CGC is a the true NGO, which doesn't really work for any benefit. There is no personal benefit in this. We are only doing it for the sake of the community. We just want to help. That's it. There is no profit. There's no one paying us. There's nothing that government will pay something or us or anyone gets happy. And we don't ac accept any kind of such gifts either. This is only, solely we are doing it to help the community. And this is not something we just started. It's been happening from over a decade now, right? We constantly helping people through the Career Guidance Council. So what I um, finally um, tell you guys is just make sure you be serious about it. You be in touch with CGC. We do weekend uh, programs also, right? You can attend those sessions, uh, talk to the guys who, who, who come there. And at the same time, what I say is whatever you know, you try to help others with that. Not always monetary help, but you can help them referring to your into your organization. You can help them sharing some knowledge. You can even do a, a training session if you want. Come to us. If you are a trainer, if you have skills to teach, if you have experience, please come to us. We will organize a session like this for you and you can deliver the training. Or if you want to become a trainer, we will help you to do that. If you have knowledge, but you don't have training skills, we can teach you, right? We are also planning to introduce uh, some, uh, you know, uh, online trainings, right? Like uh, self-paced trainings. We're coming up with that very soon. In that, we'll, we'll do some guidance and make sure we, we assign those training courses to you to learn that. But again, see, we can do, we can, oh, we can only take you to the, to the river, right? Just like you can take the horse to the river, but cannot force it to drink. It's just like that. We can show you where the water is. We can take you till the river, but ultimately it's you who has to drink the water, not we, right? So, um, so I appreciate you attending the session, right? And uh, that's it for today. Um, now, if you have any questions, you guys can feel free to raise your hand and ask the questions.